Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. We've done our part, and as I walk off into the city streets, a final word to the men and women of the Reagan Revolution, the men and women across America who for eight years did the work that brought America back. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger. We made the city freer. And we left her in good hands. All in all, not bad. Not bad at all. New York. People watching, I can only tell you that it's been an honor and a privilege to come into your homes all these years and entertain you. And I hope when I find something that I want to do and I think you will like and come back that you'll be as gracious inviting me into your home as you have been. They watch it, they say, because it makes them feel better. And it can't get better than that. It makes them happy and I, I'll, I'll never be able to top that. And I'll never be able to answer all of the cards and letters and messages that have poured in, especially in the last uh, few weeks. But I'll always remember spending these mornings with all of you. But I've always stressed to people that have known me and the media that has followed me that when I lose uh, the sense of motivation and the sense of to prove something as a basketball player, uh, it's time for me to move away from the game of basketball. How's this for drama? It's just been incredible. I got to work with lighting people who made me look better than I really am. I got to work with audio people who made me sound better than I really do. And I got to work with producers and writers. And just all kinds of talented people who make me look a lot smarter than I really am. And so, goodbye. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. Farewell speeches. They're amazing, aren't they? They're memorable. A lot of times you see someone's farewell speech, their, their final statements, their, their final goodbyes, and they leave a lasting impression of what their leadership or what their impact on their part of the world is all about. Joshua chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23 is Joshua's farewell speech to the nation of Israel. Here we have a man in Joshua who God appointed and God put in place to lead the nation of Israel after Moses' death. Now after Moses' death, Joshua took the leadership of the nation of Israel as they charged forward into taking and possessing the land that God had promised them, the promised land, the land of Canaan. They had gone through battle after battle. They had stood on the, the raging Jordan River and walked across it on dry land. They stood outside the walls of Jericho and they marched around them and they saw the walls crumble down. They faced their own weaknesses at times and called each other out and held each other accountable for them. Joshua led them through some amazing victorious times in the history of the generation of Israel at that time. Now, in Joshua chapter 23, we've been on this journey with Joshua all spring and all summer long. We come to the last final two weeks of Joshua. In Joshua chapter 23, here's what he is. He understands that he's coming to the end of his life. Time has gone on now, and Joshua is older in his age, and he realizes that his time here on earth is about done. His time of leading this nation of Israel is about done. So he gathers all the people together. He gathers the entire nation, all the leaders around them, all the people he had led, all the people that he had led with, and he gathers them around, and he begins to give them this farewell speech. This week, we're just going to look at Joshua chapter 23, the first part of his farewell speech, his final words 
to his goodbyes, his reminders, his challenges. Look with me. We're going to read this entire chapter to start with. In Joshua chapter 23, beginning in verse 1, Joshua said this, Now it came about after many days when the Lord had given rest to Israel, in other words, all the battles were over, a season of rest, from all their enemies on every side, and Joshua was old, advanced in years, that Joshua called for all Israel, for the elders and their heads and their judges and their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done all to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is He who has been fighting for you. See, I have apportioned to you these nations which remain as an inheritance for your tribes with all the nations which I have cut off from the Jordan even to the great sea towards the setting of the sun. The Lord your God, He will thrust them out before you and drive them from before you. And you will possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Be firm then, to keep all and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you will not associate with these nations. These which remain among you are mentioned the name of their gods, their false gods, or make anyone swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. Verse 8. But you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out great and strong nations from before you, And as for you, no man has stood before you to this day. One of your men puts to flight a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you, just as he promised you. So take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. For if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations, these which remain among you, and you intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know with certainty that the Lord your God will continue to drive these nations out from before you, but they will be a snare and a trap to you, and a whip on your sides and a thorn in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Verse 14. Now behold, today I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord God has spoken concerning you has failed. All has been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. It shall come about that just as all the good words which the Lord your God spoke to you have come upon you, so the Lord will bring you upon all the threats until He has destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which He commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you will perish quickly from off the good land which He has given you. Here's the first part of this farewell speech that, that Joshua is making. Uh, there's some key verses in here, some key thoughts that I want us to, to, to focus in on. Look at this, first of all. Look back at verse 6. Let me just read some series of verses. Look back at verse 6. Put your eyes on verse 6. Because Joshua said this to them. He, he's taking this opportunity to gather them up. He's taking this opportunity to, to say his final things that he wants to say. And in verse 6 he says this, Be firm. Some translations may say, Be strong. Remember, that was what Joshua was told when he was first put in place by God. When God said, hey, I want you to be the one to lead my people into the promised land because of your faithfulness, because of your obedience those 40 years prior when you and Caleb said, hey, we can go possess this land. You were the one. And he said this to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous because I am going to use you to lead these people. Now, Joshua, one of the final things that he says to his people is be firm or be strong. The rest of verse 6 says, Be firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. Stand strong, be strong and follow the commands of God. Be strong in this as you continue to live life, as you continue to move forward. I want you to stay strong. I want you to be firm in the groundings of the word of God and what God has told us and what God has given us through his servant Moses, how God has led us, as God has proven himself to us. You be strong in God. You be firm in your belief and your trust and in your obedience to him. Remember, this is the generation of Israel that stepped out in obedience. This is the generation of Israel that stepped out in faithfulness. And he says, I want you to be strong. I want you to continue to be firm in following after what God has told us to do. The obedience of that. Look at verse 8. He continues that same thought in verse 8 when he says this, But you, 
but you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. Cling to God. In other words, may remain faithful to Him. If you're going to be firm, if you're going to stand strong, if you're going to be strong and courageous, you've got to cling to God. I mean, that means hold on to Him. I mean, that's like when you're clinging to something. If you're like hanging off the edge of a cliff and you've got this rope, I mean, you are clinging to it, right? You're going to wrap your legs around. You're going to wrap your arms around. You're going to intertwine it. You're going to wrap. I mean, you're going to, because you don't want to fall, right? I mean, you're going to hold on to that as tight as you can. And that's what he says. As you go through life, cling like your life depends upon it to God. I mean, you hold God close to your life. You get as close to God as you can. You get close to his word. You get close to his promises. You get close to his truth. And you hold them close to your heart. You hold your life close to him and cling to him. He says, as you have done to this day, this generation of Israel, you've done this. You've held close to him. Now I'm telling you to remain faithful in that. Then in verse 11, he says the same thought. Verse 11, he says, so take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. Diligent heed. We talk about this word a lot, um, intentional, around here, especially around our leadership team and our staff. We talk about being intentional all the time. That's what he's saying. He says, be diligent. In other words, take diligent, be intentional, be intentional, be diligent to heed yourselves to love the Lord your God. In other words, make sure that in your life you are loving the Lord your God. We talked about this last week. You're loving Him with all your heart, all your soul, your mind, your strength. Everything about you is falling in love with God and is loving God with your words, with your actions, with your deeds. Why? Because you're clinging to Him, you're holding strong to Him, and you're standing strong. You are being strong in Him. That's what He's saying to them. You've done it this time. My time of leading you, Joshua is saying the nation of Israel is coming to an end, but I want you to stand strong. I want you to be strong, and I want you to be faithful to God. But there's another thought that's threaded all throughout this challenge, and this is the thought I want to focus on today. Look at this next verse in verse 3. He begins to share this, and he threads this thought right along with that thought of being strong and faithful to God. He threads this thought through it. Verse 3, he starts it when he says, You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has been fighting for you. He begins to remind them. He begins to show them, remember, this wasn't us. This wasn't about us. This wasn't about you. This is about God. We've got to stop and reflect and see that all of God and all that God has done for us in this journey that we've been on together. That's what he begins to say there. Look at he says that in verse three that all you have to see all that the Lord your God has done. Sometimes we have to open our eyes and see all that God has done. Sometimes we get so busy going through life, we get so busy just plowing through, we get so busy just chasing after dreams and doing this. Sometimes we don't stop and just see and open our eyes of all the things that God has done around us. Things that we consider big and things that we may consider little, but the things and the provisions and the care of God around us. And he said in the second part of that verse, he goes, remember all these battles we fought? Remember all these things? Remember those those walls of Jericho? Remember those giants that we had to say? Remember those great armies and those great cities? He said said that at the end of verse 3, for the Lord your God is he who's been fighting for you. Don't forget, it's been God who's been fighting all these battles for us. He intertwines this thought of giving God the credit, giving God the praise. Look at verse 9. Because in verse 9, he continued this, and he says, For the Lord has driven out great and strong nations before you. And he says, no man, at the end of that verse, no man has stood before you to this day. No enemy has been able to stand before you. And it's not because you are ultimately strong or because you were really, really smart or because you were really, really faithful. The reason you, that no enemy was able to stand against you was because of your God. Our God defeated that. He says, our God defeated strong and mighty nations before you. Nations that were supposed to beat you. Enemies that were supposed to take you down. Battles that you were supposed to lose. You won, and it had to do everything with God. Because He's the one who destroys those strongholds. Look at verse 11. He goes on, he says this in verse 11. So, I'm sorry, not verse 11, verse 10. Verse 10 says one of your men puts to flight a thousand for the lord your god is he who fights for you just as he promised in other words he put to flight the thousand in other words he took this army one of you he says has defeated a thousand armies a thousand people and it was why because god is the one that fought for you all throughout this what he does is just this intertwine this thought in this farewell speech guys 
let's remember to give God the credit. He reminds the nation of Israel of all that God has blessed them with in the past in this journey. He reminds them that it is God who fought their battles. It was God who gave them the victories. It literally becomes, his farewell speech becomes this praise of God. This praise of, hey, let's be reminded of all that God does, all the amazing things that God has done. Let's be reminded. It becomes this praise and this glorification. And let's raise God up. And sometimes in life, we need to stop and recognize the amazing things that God does around us. We need to sometimes change our perspective because sometimes we get in this perspective of life where life gets tough, battles get really hard, enemies are pounding on you, life is struggling, circumstances aren't going great, and life is kind of tough, right? And what happens, we get into that perspective of life and we think how bad it is. We think about how, how much this is just defeating us, how, how heavy life is, how, how much of a struggle life is. And sometimes we just need to change the perspective by not necessarily changing our circumstance, but we just change how we look at it. We look at the amazing God, how God provided for us all through the past. We were reminded about how God gave me victory in this and victory in that, how God gave me strength to carry that battle. So if I'm still in this circumstance, if I remember what God has done for me, then I'd realize that he's going to take care of me here. So it's about this perspective to remember to praise God. It's about a perspective to giving God credit for the things that he's done, the things that he's doing, and the things that he is going to do in our life. It's about giving God praise. It's about giving God credit. That's what he was saying to them. Hey, let's be reminded. Let me, if I'm saying my final words to you, Israel, the next, Joshua says to them, if I'm saying my final things to you, this is how I want to start. Praise God and be reminded of what he has done. Let's give him credit for the amazing things that has happened on this journey that we've been on together. He gives them this warning, this warning of kind of being aware of, of self-exaltation. Sometimes I think we have to be, we have to hear that warning sometimes. There's this idea of self-exaltation because that person who kind of becomes a self-exalted person, that's a person who thinks he's standing on his own merit. And sometimes God wants us to be reminded that we are not standing upon our own merit. That is the things of God around us. It's God, what God has done for us. But we think of the great things we have done. We think of the great obedience we've had. We think of the great faithfulness we have. We think of the great strength that we had. And we feel like we're standing on our own. But we have to be aware. And this is what he's telling the nation of Israel. Do not self-exalt. Because see, at its worst, when self-exaltation begins to become a part of our life, when it comes at this worst, it becomes this self-praise. Look how great I am. Look how spiritual I am. Look at the good things that's happening in my life. It becomes self-honoring. It becomes self-glorifying. And at its very worst, it can become even self-worshipping. Where all of a sudden now, your focus isn't even on God, but it's on you and your abilities and your strengths and your smarts and your creativity and all of this. And he's saying, I want you to beware, nation of Israel, not to exalt yourself, but to exalt the one who has put you there, and that is God. Do not exalt your own accomplishments, but exalt the one who gave you those accomplishments. When we see victory in our life, when we see blessings in our life, it, we're tempted to take credit for it. We're tempted to, to take credit for the obstacles that we've overcome or, or the battles that we've won or, or the blessings that we get to reap the benefits of. But Joshua is reminding them in his speech here, he's charging them to be careful not to claim credit. Sometimes we have to be careful not to to claim credit for the things that God is doing around our life. You see, thinking that God's involvement is related to our righteousness is dangerous. We think that, that God is doing this because of what I did. That, that God is doing this because of my righteous actions. That's why all this blessing is happening. That's why all this goodness is happening. That's why this, these victories are given to me because I, because I was righteous, right? Thinking that God's involvement is related to our righteous actions is dangerous. You see, God may have brought that victory in your life. God may have bring, brought those blessings in your life regardless of your righteousness. He may have brought that in just because of his goodness, because of his care, because of his love, 
Maybe he did it because of his faithfulness to us. Maybe he did it for his pleasure. Maybe he did it to fulfill a kingdom's purpose that he had in mind. And in spite of you, he did something good. I'm telling you, I pray that prayer all the time. God, in spite of me, will you do great things? Because I know me. And when we start to think that we take credit because of the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, because of our righteous actions or because of our righteousness, it gets dangerous because sometimes God just does those things because maybe he has a kingdom's purpose in mind. Maybe he has just his goodness coming on to you. But we have to understand what the nation of Israel had to understand. What Joshua was reminding them is that they could not earn the victory. They could not do to earn the victory. And God warned them back in Deuteronomy. If you have a second, here you go. Put a marker in Joshua chapter 23. Flip back to Deuteronomy for a second. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Just back towards Genesis. Deuteronomy chapter 9. God warned the nation of Israel even before this about thinking that they maybe have earned these victories. This, this, this is a warning that he gave them ahead of time. It's a great reminder for us. It's what Joshua was reminding of them. Deuteronomy chapter 9, find verse 4 in that chapter. Here's what it says. It says, Do not say in your heart when the Lord your God has driven them out before you, those enemies, this possession of the land of Canaan. Do not say in your heart when the Lord your God has driven them out before you, because of my righteousness the Lord has brought me into the possession and to possess this land but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the lord is dispossessing them before you it is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you are going to possess their land but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the lord your god is driving them out before you in order to confirm the oath which the lord swore to the fathers to abraham isaac and jacob look at verse six now then it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess, for you are a stubborn people. You're, this has nothing to do with you, nation of Israel. You taking this land was not because you have been such amazing, amazing people that God's going to reward you. He says, you're getting this land because the people in that land are wicked. And for God's kingdom purpose, he is driving them out because they are not worshiping him. They are wicked people against the things of God. You just happen to be the recipient of some of God's work and God's plan. You're stubborn people. So stop thinking that it's all because of you. And sometimes that's exactly what we have to be reminded of. These blessings, these things in God's, and the things that in our life, the things around us, victories, blessings, provision. It's not because we earned it. It's not because we did some great things. God was just doing something. See, the Lord brings victory. It is God himself, and this is what Joshua is driving. He's saying, I've got a chance to tell you one more thing. I'm telling you that God, who has been fighting for us, it is God and is all about God, and it is God who gives us the victories in life. It is God who secured your place in the promised land. It is God himself who drove out those people. It is God himself who took care of you and has given you this land. This victory, the victories that you are celebrating, nation of Israel, this victory is all about God's grace. It's about God's work in our life. And these times in life when we go through things and we have this, it's about God's grace in our life. We cannot earn things from God blessings victories come from his goodness the amazing goodness of god now does this mean that we just get to go live life however we want no that, that remember what it says to, first of all he said cling close to god follow his commands be faithful to him, be obedient to him. That was the thing he intertwined with that. He didn't leave this one thought just by itself. He intertwined it with this other thought of cling close to God. Be strong and courageous. Be strong in your obedience to God. In other words, faithfully follow after God, but realize this. All the blessings and all these victories and all these things in life has to do with God and not you. It has to do with God bringing us a victory. It has to do with his goodness. It has to do with his grace. You see, our righteousness has nothing to do with us anyways. Our righteousness in the eyes of God has everything to do with Jesus Christ. Our righteousness, we can't be good enough. We can't do a good enough obedience. We can't be 
have good enough deeds and good enough service and do good enough things to be found righteous in the eyes of God. See, God sees our righteousness through the cross of Jesus Christ. Through the fulfillment of the New Testament and all of this, what we see is that Jesus Christ came to this earth as a gift to us from God Himself, God's Son, given to us as a sacrifice for our sins because our righteousness is not there because of sin in our life. And the sin in my life, it makes me separated from God. And God says, I want to be in relationship with you so much. I want you to be righteous because in your righteousness, you get to spend eternity with me in a very real place called heaven. But you can't earn that. But I'm going to be a gracious and merciful God. I'm going to give a sacrifice of my son, Jesus Christ, who's going to be crucified to a cross. And in his death, he's going to be put into a tomb. And in that tomb, he's going to raise again in three days. And that death and that resurrection is the payment for all of our sins. And if you and I would come to a place to believe that we needed a Savior, that it is my sin that needs to be forgiven, and that Jesus Christ died on that cross for me, not because I earned it, but because of the grace that God gave me, the blessing that God gave me in that, and I would humble myself at the cross of Christ. And I would say that Jesus Christ died for me. He died for my sins. He rose again. And that's the payment of my salvation. Guess what? God sees you as righteous because he looks at you through the cross of Christ. He doesn't look at you through your goodness. He doesn't look at you through your deeds. He doesn't look at you through your service. He looks at your life through the cross of Christ that you've humbled yourself behind. See, the nation of Israel was being reminded by their leader, Joshua, that it was all about God. It was all about his goodness. It was all about what he had done. It was about the battles that he had fought for them. It was about the enemies that he had defeated for them. But it was not them. It was about God. And he was saying, I want you to give God the credit. And we can be reminded and challenged by Joshua in the exact same way. We need to give thanks for the goodness of God in our life. We need to give credit for the goodness, for the gifts that God's given us. Whatever those gifts are, for the blessings, for the victories, we need to cherish those and we need to make good use of those things. We make good use of the blessings and the victories and and, and the great things that God has given to us. That's how we move forward through life, faithfully depending upon Him. This week, this week, I want to challenge us as a church for this week to be a week of praise. That in our life, in our life as individuals, in our life as a family, in our life as a church, this is a week of praise. This is a challenge. I'm challenging us to go out this week and to give God credit. I want us to open our eyes and to see Him, see the things that He's done, see the blessings in our life, see the care that He has. And you might say, well, that's just a simple thing. That's just, I had a meal to eat today because I, I worked a job and I had a paycheck, really, because God gave you that job. God gave you those abilities, and he's blessed you with that work. Well, I, I had a place to sleep tonight because uh, we built a really nice house, and we, we saved a lot of money over years to buy this. No, God gave you those abilities, and God gave you that. God gave you health within your family. He gave you children within your family. He gave you friends around you. All the blessings, all the care, sometimes the blinders need to come off, and we just need to see the work of God and give him credit instead of trying to steal it for ourselves. You've got to give God the credit for victories in your life, those struggles that you've overcome, those battles that you have fought, and the things that you've overcome, the God that has given you the victory over that, the gifts in your life, the abilities in your life, the gift of salvation that He's offered you and that many of you have accepted and made a part of your life. Why you give God credit? So this is my challenge to us this week, that we will give God credit. I want you in your small groups this week. If your small group is meeting this week, I'm asking you to spend a time together as a small group simply going around your living room, going around that coffee table, going around that restaurant table, wherever you meet. And I want you individually to just praise God and give God credit for something in your life. I want to challenge you. I'm challenging myself, challenging us, that when you're sitting aside some time with your family, maybe it's around your dinner table this week, Maybe it's sitting in the living room and you just need to turn off the TV. I want you to go around your family and I want you to give God credit for things that's going on in your life. I want you to use your social media this week, whatever social media you have, your Twitter, your Instagram, your Facebook, whatever it is, and I want you to give God 
credit so that the world around us and the people in our life see us that it's not about us. It's about an amazing God that I worship. It's about an amazing God that I follow. And I'm going to give him credit for all kinds of things in my life because it's all about him. Give him credit for those blessings. Give him, give him credit for, for care. Give him credit for provision. Give him credit for your gifts. Give him credit for your family. Give him credit for your talents. Give him credit for your salvation that he's offered to you. That's our challenge this week. And maybe for some of you, you've never experienced that salvation we talked about. We start talking about giving God credit. Maybe you need to understand that God gave you that gift of salvation. I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes for a moment. We open our eyes, we take our blinders off, and we give God credit for the amazing things in our life that He has done. For His grace that gave us His Son, Jesus Christ. And maybe in here today, maybe in here this morning, you've been depending upon your good deeds, you've been depending upon your goodness, you've been depending upon something else for your righteousness, being in right standing with God. You've been depending on everything but the cross of Jesus Christ. And maybe today you need to accept and humble yourself before the cross of Christ, understanding that it was a gift from Him, and only by Him and through Him are you given the gift of salvation. So maybe in your heart and your mind right now, you would want to pray a prayer to pray and talk to God to understand and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your salvation through His death. There's not a certain prayer of words that you say, but in your heart right now, maybe you would just want to acknowledge to God that you realize that you are a sinner and you have the need of a Savior. Maybe you need to confess before Him that you've never depended upon the cross of Christ for that. Maybe you need to to declare your belief and your trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your salvation, for your right standing before God. Right now, in your words and your thoughts and your prayer, you can accept Jesus as the way of your salvation. I don't know, but there possibly may have been somebody today, maybe a few, that here in this moment, you chose to accept Jesus Christ for your salvation. You chose to humble yourselves at the cross and let that be the payment and your way into relationship with God. If that was you, I would like to ask you to have a bold moment right now. Eyes are closed. Myself, maybe a few church leaders are looking, but I would like to ask you to have a moment of boldness right now and simply acknowledge that yes, today, in that moment, I prayed and I accepted Jesus Christ for my salvation. If that was you, would you just raise your hand? That's all I'm asking you to do. Just raise your hand for a moment. Let me see it, and then you can put it down. That's all. gift of salvation is incredible. For those that raised your hand today, I praise God for you. And I praise God for your and my salvation. Let's go through this week making sure that we aren't trying to steal God's glory. God, we thank you for who you are. We praise you for who you are. We praise you for the amazing things you do in our life. God, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 This week, let's give God the credit for what he's done in our lives. It's incredible, incredible that he does anything in our lives. If you're like me, you think, man, I don't deserve anything. But God gives me so much. We have so much to be grateful for. As Pastor James mentioned, we want to give 
God credit in every aspect of our lives this week. And we also want to, we want to do this. We want to flood our social media pages with a hashtag, which if you're like, what is that? It's a number sign with letters after it and no spaces, okay? For some reason, our culture has decided this is cool. And until it's not cool, we're going to keep doing it over and over and over again. And so we want to use this hashtag, giving God credit. And what that does is at the end of this week, if you click on that hashtag on social media, it will categorize all of the posts that have been made with that hashtag. And you get to see all of the different things that people are thankful for, that they're giving God credit for. So it would be so cool if at the end of this week, we looked on Instagram and we saw teenagers that were flooding Instagram saying, we're giving God credit for this. And we saw moms and dads saying, we're giving God credit for this. And we saw pastors and elders and deacons saying, we're giving God credit for this. And we see a single mom saying, saying we're giving God credit for this because we've all got things that we could give God credit for. So let's do that this week. Before we leave, after the last song, let's stick around for 30 seconds and give God credit. And the people at the second service will be like, what happened at the first service? We'll be like, it was awesome. You got to get here. So let's do that together, church. Let's give God the credit. Give him the glory for everything that he has done. We're going to sing about that as we leave this place. So let's stand and let's give him all the attention in this place today. Oh, put your hands together. Let's sing it out. From the highest storm to the earth below, you lay down your life.